So I am going to talk to you about internal erosion, the big event that you've all been waiting for, I'm sure. There's a ton of information here. I'm gonna try and rip through a lot of things in the next hour. Um, there is a, an entire week dedicated to internal erosion. I'm gonna cram a lot of that into an hour. All right, so some learning objectives. By the end of this slide, uh, by the end of this module, you should be able to describe physical locations of where the internal erosion is going to take place in the foundation, in the embankment, the processes or the mechanisms of the actual internal erosion itself, as well as the phases of internal erosion, which are essentially the steps in, in, in internal erosion. Uh, discuss the historical significance of internal erosion and the case history that, 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 that kind of result, uh, relate to that. And outline typical event trees and some case histories as well as use proce uh, the use processes for estimating the probabilities of internal erosion. So that's a lot of things. So we're going to talk about the mechanisms, just going to teach you about it in general, and give you a little bit of an approach for actually assessing risk on it. That is a ton of information. So let's get, let's get started. Um, so let's talk a little bit about historical significance, starting with uh, an, a video here. So... Um, all dams and levees have some seepage as the impounded water seeks past of least resistance through the embankment and foundation and should be controlled to prevent erosion of the embankment or foundation or damage to concrete structure. Internal erosion may be occurring if the seepage rate is increasing without an increase in the impounded water stage or if the flow is not clear and carrying soil, uh, soil particles. You know, that would be bad. So what you're looking at here is sort of a... Uh, example of concentrated leak erosion where we had some sort of a flaw and now that flaw is getting larger and starting to move more and more particles and we're seeing a lot of muddy water coming out down here, um, which is bad. So this would continue. Um, there's a pipe that's formed. You see that muddy water forming down here. We eventually start to collapse that and the overlying embankment that moves its way upstream until we lose the crust. Now we're overtopping and we're opening up a breach in the entire embankment. So that's everything kind of wrapped up in one, that's the internal erosion failure mode from start to finish, which is exactly how you should be thinking about that when you're doing it in a risk assessment. So some statistics on embankment failures. Um, Mark Foster, he's a smarty out there at the University of New South Wales, Australia, examined the statistics of large embankment dam failures constructed between 1800 and 1986. He basically wrapped up a whole lot of operation years and tried to draw out some conclusions from all that data. What he came up with is about 50% of all dam incidents are related to internal erosion, and it's the most common of, uh, of failures. If, if failures due to overtopping, which is like 36%, and spillway gate failures, which is like 12%, aren't combined. Um, so typically how I've thought about that is about 45% internal erosion, which includes um, internal erosion along some sort of like penetrating structure with its own or something. And then almost another half is overtopping. And then about 10% is like slope instability due to seismic issues. Um, so internal erosion failure can occur during first filling. Um, you know, when we're first testing the dam at normal loading, just sitting out there on a sunny day, or due to degradation over time triggered by a subsequent, potentially, possibly lower event or above a record level. So it could be sitting out there for 5, 10, 50 years and things just degrade, which is why we do risk assessments. Then, right? We try to understand and predict these, these things before they happen. And again, if you start to hit that record level, you're sort of like back in the first filling situation again. So always something to be concerned about and should be uh, observed and watched appropriately. Um, unlike some of the other potential failure modes, failures have actually happened and continue to happen. An important point is that incidents or accidents are much more common than failures. Um, so we're still compiling data uh, by levy segment for USACE levies. Uh, Dave Schaff is working on this. He's getting a lot of really interesting information. There's going to be a lot of interesting things to talk about um, when he when we can start to pull all that together and start to make failure rates associated with that. But here's a snapshot in time since not all USACE levy segments have been uh, included yet. Number of levy incidents shown likely, uh, show likely, like, show likely grossly underestimates the actual number of incidents. So this is more like the documented incidents as opposed to the actual number. A significant incident for this database required um, a flood fight to protect breach, 
either or or major interior flooding, or there was a post post flood repair costing fifty million dollars. That's what it was. Um, failure is consistently interpreted by all to mean an event that leads to catastrophic, uncontrolled release of impounded water. And an accident is sometimes used in literature, including I call to refer to an event that does not lead to breach, often because of successful intervention. Incident is used in reclamation and frequently in the, in the literature. It's synonymous, kind of means the same thing, but bottom line is that there haven't been, there's been far more incidents than failures than in the, uh, in the combined category. So, you know, 2,800 invasion incidents, about half of those were significant. 234 water related incidents, about a quarter of those were significant, and then 56 failures. So you can see, you know, we have a lot more embankment uh, than we have flood walls, but flood walls are not um, failure proof. Organizing, so let's talk a little bit about the location of internal erosion. So organizing these case histories by location of internal erosion pathway, it's useful to evaluate historical failures and incidents. It gives, gives us this understanding of failure rates. It's also important about how we communicate these things. Um, so typically these organizations are, are, these are organized by three categories or physical locations, through the embankment, through the foundation, and from embankment into foundation, which also includes embankment foundation contact, blah, blah, blah. We'll talk about that more later. Others uh, added along or into embedded structures, such as along those conduits, uh, like we were talking about before, or spillway walls, something that's continuous from upstream to downstream across the embankment, and into drains. These categories, are, they're not uh, potential failure mode descriptions. Um, they're just part of a potential failure mode description. So we don't want to restrict any creative thinking uh, by prescribing a location. We also, you know, I might add that when we initially establish a location, don't be hindered by like, oh, we just got to keep this in this, this embankment. It can't go anywhere else. You know, uh, let that failure path go where the data tells it to go. So don't allow yourself to be artificially restricted by something. Um, look for that most, legal, most likely way that water is going to flow through here and damage that dam. That's your failure path. But you want to communicate it by location, by the mechanism. Uh, and how it results in failure. We want to describe that potential failure mode all the way through. So let's talk about some of these processes of internal erosion. Um, so over the years, engineers who have been looking at things like this have determined like a terminology, a lexicon over the years so that we can talk to each other about it. They're difficult processes. You know, um, Prospect has a secret and popping course, and we're trying to get away from that nomenclature. Um, Manel is going to have a sword fight with Mike Naywin about whether or not um, secret and piping is going to continue to be called secret and piping because that's that language is not specific. There's a lot of there's like several different internal erosion mechanisms, and we want to be able to speak specifically about them so that we can communicate them well. So this figure illustrates specific mechanisms and processes of internal erosion. That have been observed in case histories and discussed in the chapter. Um, the general processes to consider, and we're going to talk about these a whole lot more than just this slide, um, are concentrated leak erosion. Um, maybe if you get my little laser pointer out here, which is right here, this guy, backwards erosion piping, internal instability. Um, maybe one of the, which is also called suffusion, suffusion, and is really not something that we deal with that, that much, but something, something to be aware of. Um, soil contact erosion, and right here, this uh, internal mi migration or stoping, and you can kind of see this, these things up here in this embankment a little bit. Um, yeah, but we're going to talk about this much more. Um, Four of these processes are the same as an I cold bolt in 164, which kind of is like the world uh, documentation body, et cetera, that kind of sets these standards and where we all come together and kind of agree about how we should assess these internal erosion issues with internal migration being added by the federal agencies. Um, I cold bolt in 164 describes a stoping process as a global backward erosion, considers this as a subset of BEP, but that's all we're going to say about that, anyhow. Um, so let's start talking about these things. And 
see up here. So concentrated leak erosion, it's a form of scour, refers to an internal erosion process involving leakage flowing through an opening in the soil or rock mass. So this is a pre-existing flaw. This is something that is an open pathway and all flowing through it. Um, openings can be cracks, gaps, other defects in the embankment or open defects in the soil or rock mass in the foundation. This process is distinguished from other processes of internal erosion by the soil particles eroding from the sides of the opening. So water on this side is pushing water through here, and that water flows through here. It seeds the uh, critical shear stress of this soil because it's imparting shear stress on that soil and it starts to pluck those materials off. And that process continues, it widens it, and it makes it bad. Cracking occurs in the soil. Um, When the tensile stresses in the soil exceed the tensile strength capacity of the soil. Um, it's a minor stress, major stress, minor major principal stress, excuse me, thing. Um, and, but it really resolves, revolves around developing these low stress zones, which I think we're going to talk a little bit more about. Uh, something else that can occur is a hydraulic fracture. It involves the formation and extension of an opening in the soil mass due to increasing water pressure. So you're actually putting water in there and it's jacking a crack open. Doesn't happen too often, but it can happen. Um, I think um, uh, laboratory testing has shown that it takes some pretty big pressures to make that happen, almost larger than what we can generate with some of our embankments, but it's something to be aware of, especially if you have a pre-existing crack that closed up and now can be more uh, susceptible to something like that. Um, there's a wide variety of mechanisms that can create cracks or other defects through which concentrated leaks can develop. Many of these are related to differential settlement and the development of these low stress zones um, or poorly compacted or high permeability zones in the embankment. So essentially any place that we have an opening that water can flow through, from upstream to downstream. Um, yeah, so this figure is showing a continuous crack through a homogeneous earth fill embankment. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, another of these major, this, that's probably the heaviest or one of the most important um, internal erosion mechanisms to consider, concentrated leak erosion. This is another one, backwards erosion piping. So back on this one, a quick note. This failure mode, um, typically, so it involves, it, it involves this open crack. And that means it has to have soil that will hold an open crack. So something that has some cohesion to it, something that can sustain a crack, like a clay like material, or a, something that has some portion of clay in it, of some plasticity. Bathroom erosion piping is something that um, is usually restricted to more of a sandy material, a cohesionless material. Even though there, there might be some clay content to it, but it's usually a relatively clean sand find a medium with a coefficient of uniformity of about three to four. Anyhow, I digress. So more of a sandy type material is what uh, BEP happens in. It's um, back erosion piping is the detachment of soil particles at a free unfiltered surface at the downstream end typically, in which the process gradually works its way up uh, towards the upstream or flood side of the embankment or its foundation until a continuous pipe is formed. You kind of see that in this, these, these set, sets of pictures. Um, it's probably restricted to, like we talked about, non-plastic soils or soils with only limited plasticity. Um, and yeah, so um, to occur, there must, there must be a flow path or a source of water, an unprotected exit from which material can escape, or be confined by a set enough material that those pressures can break through it. Um, erodible material within the flow path that can be carried to the exit and the material being piped or the material directly above it must be able to form and support a roof, excuse me, or a pipe. So we have some kind of roof over material all the way across. So we have this cohesive layer overlaying this, uh, this sandy layer so a pipe can actually form without that, that roof collapse. And so this is our flaw, is that continuous path of erodible material that can also uh, conduct the seepage flow and drive that, that flow. Okay.
Another one, uh, another internal erosion mechanism that we want to be aware of is internal migration. That occurs when soil particles move or drop into an open defect and are carried away by seepage to an unfiltered exit. Um, if extensive void capacity exists in coarse soils or bedrock, however, an open exit may not be needed, but sufficient storage space for eroded farm particles could be available. So you could sort of post all that eroded material. Have to be pretty big to absorb an entire embankment. Um, so most common, it's an interconnected path of um, a flaws essentially through a foundation like limestone that can basically as material roads down into it, it can carry that material out and away downstream, and it just continues. This can go on for months, years, until eventually your crest starts to, this this wood approaches more and more towards the crest, and uh, to make it pulls in, you get a big sinkhole. So if the sinkhole formed on the upstream side of your embankment, underneath the, uh, the water level, that would be bad. If it happens on the downstream side, at least we have some time to do something about it. We have a pretty good track record of being to successfully intervene in this failure mode and arrest this, this failure mode if it materializes in a place that we can see it. All right, soil contact erosion or scour, another one of our uh, internal erosion mechanisms. So soil contact erosion is also a form of scour and involves a selective erosion of fine particles from the contact with a coarser layer caused by the passing of flow through that coarser layer that's parallel to the contact. So it relates only to conditions where the flow in the coarser layer is parallel to the interface between the coarse and the fine layer. I know we do have this guy. So, um, we have this coarse material, we can move a lot of water through it, or maybe it's down deep. And we have this fine grain material, which can move a lot of water, but it is erodible. And so these, these uh, materials get plucked into the flow and it gets moved away. It's worse if the fine grain material is overlying this coarse grain material because then gravity is working against this. So it's material falling in here and it's removed by the, uh, the seepage flowing through here. Um, Contact erosion of scour has been used in the literature to describe erosion of core material at the core foundation contact due to seepage flow. Um, let's just skip that part. So this is what it looks like in the embankment section. These are all the locations where this CE or this uh, contact erosion can occur. We have a coarser layer adjacent to a finer layer that's more erodible. So we have seepage moving through here and yeah, and we can erode these materials in contact. Uh, same with this, if we have some sort of foundation material that can move water, or maybe this can move water faster than this. Same thing over here. We have a clay core, and we have a clay foundation. But this is more permeable than this material. So maybe we can erode this, this material as it goes to here, or maybe erode this material as it goes to here. All kinds of opportunities for stuff like that. Something to be aware of. Fusion and suffusion, um, or internal instability. So we talked about that at the beginning of this a little bit. Um, I think maybe reclamation has one um, incident or potentially failure, I think more likely an incident that they can lay at the foot of this, but it's really not a huge concern, And but it does potentially um, is a complicating factor in another type of internal erosion mechanism. So it describes the loss of particles as a result of seepage in which the finer particles in the soil are able to move within the soil mass under the forces imposed by the particles by seepage flow. So, so fusion is a selective erosion of finer particles of an internally unstable soil, which is what we call that when these kind of small particles can move through the big uh, particles, um, leaving behind a soil skeleton formed by coarser, coarser particles. So larger particles are class supported. So that's the so these big particles are in contact with each other and they'll stay that way. So if you remove these small particles out, it's not going to change. It just gets more permeable. So you can move a higher volume of water through. Um, the suffusion is a little bit different because now it's matrix supported. So these small materials can erode out whichever way your seepage is going. 
And these larger particles kind of move in and then contact each other. And then there's, there's so essentially either one leaves your embankment still stable. But this one, there won't be any bubbling change because big particles are already in contact with each other. This one, it may kind of deform, and but it's still going to be standing there. Could lead to other things, particularly when you start to really uh, accelerate the volume of seepage that you can get through. So it can make other materials and mechanisms uh, more susceptible and more likely to occur. Okay, so I think we're doing okay on time here, amazingly. Um, let's talk about the phases of internal erosion. So again, these are the steps in the internal erosion process from start to finish. Um, process of internal erosion has been generally broken into four phases in the chapter and internationally in Eichel Bolton 164, our old friend. Initiation involves a detachment of soil particles. Um, continuation involves inadequate particle retention. Uh, so that's kind of based on filtering considerations. You know, once this happens, is there anything physically in the way to actually arrest the movement of these eroded particles? Progression involves a continuous particle transport and enlargement of the erosion pathway. Can it keep going? Can it progress? Can it get worse? Um, and then failure or breach is characterized by the sudden, rapid, uncontrolled release of impounded water or liquid-borne solids. So that's actually... That, that failure definition is from FEMA. Um, everybody agrees on it. That's really what we're looking at. There are some, um, some different definitions of failure in special cases, uh, particularly with NAV dams. You know, we're looking at economic issues there. Or if there are personnel working at the dam, like in a power plant, we certainly don't want to lose the lives of those good people. And, but that may not result in a loss of uh, an uncontrolled release of impounded water downstream. But it could. So there's some special considerations that uses it, but 99% of the time, that's our definition of uh, failure. Um, so in this example from Fell et al. 2008, first three phases of the case of uh, scour initiating uh, a, a potential failure mode through a zoned embankment are, are shown. Transverse crack exists in the core of the embankment dam. And the reservoir levels rise to a level to generate sufficient hydraulic shear stress in the crack to initiate erosion. So we brought this level up uh, high enough that it can push water through here fast enough where it starts to pluck these individual materials off. And so it can continue because this downstream shell is now filtered compatible. So those eroded materials can now, they don't be stopped right here at this interface. They can move into here. And then it progresses. It's larger because we can continue to move the material in here, and the reservoir stays up high. And um, you know the side walls don't slow you down. So, you know the roof doesn't collapse. Generally, the rest of the, pro the process. So here's our generic sequence of events, what you may call a uh, event tree for um, internal erosion uh, potential failure mode. Um, so there's more than four steps here, but we kind of uh, we usually group a couple of these into a single step. And we're going to talk more about that here in a couple of minutes. Um, so the geometric condition for initiation, first one, um, it's an inherent weakness or flaw in an embankment or foundation. So it can include material susceptibility on a particle size scale, like is it erodible? and continuity on a field scale, like is it continuous all the way across our embankment. Um, on an understanding of the site characterization, embankment and foundation geometry, geomorphology and geology, et cetera. And then we have our hydraulic condition for initiation. So we have a flaw. Now we're putting energy behind it. Our, we're obtaining a pool. We're, we're pouring gas on the side on the kindling here. Um, and then uh, our next one, our next couple here, our progression. Uh, it's it's, so progression is decomposed into mechanical and hydraulic conditions. The chapter decomposes progression into three events, holding a roof, crack filling action, and upstream flow limitation, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about here in a few minutes. Holding a roof and crack filling action are mechanical conditions. And uh, upstream flow limitation, that's a hydraulic condition. You know, do we keep that pull up long enough to make this thing happen? 
These events are only applicable to concentrated leak erosion. Um, that's confusing the issue a little bit here, but uh, I'll let this keep it being. So this is an event tree. So these are these events depicted in how we would normally use them in a risk assessment. Um, so while a variety of methods are available for analyzing engineering risks, event trees have become the common approach for dam and levee safety risk assessments and in multiple things across, you know, different agencies, different industries. Event tree is a graphical depiction of the sequence of events leading to a particular set of outcomes, like a breach. Um, event trees are used to obtain quantitative estimates of the probability of dam and levee failure and associated consequences. So we use these in quantitative risk assessments. They're also valuable for quality of risk assessments because it helps us understand the steps. It helps us think that um, in an SQRA, um, we can say that, okay, we know uh, that some of these are gonna be a yes for, for sure, and some of these are gonna be, we're not sure. Like uh, continuous susceptible to internal erosion exists. Well, we know very well that there's a continuous sand layer under there. So that's a one. We have so much time talking about that. Um, we know there's no filter out there. We would be able to see it. It's not designed, so that's a one. Um, so breach is going to be a one. If you take it that far, yeah, it's not. That's going to be. It's almost certain it's going to breach. But you know what? This initial con uh, hydraulic condition of uh, erosion. I'm not sure about that. You know, maybe we can spend our, our valuable time together to talk about this, and maybe one other. So you can use these as a tool to help direct the conversation during a risk assessment. They're valuable for all things. So let's talk about initiation. Initiation of internal erosion occurs when hydraulic forces exerted by water seeping through pores or cracks of a dam or a levee or its foundation are sufficient to cause particle detachment. We initiate erosion. It's governed by the mechanics of, of equilibrium of the soil particles and is most difficult event to estimate. Um, we have some things that can help us though. For concentrated leak erosion, Estimating the uh, the applied hydraulic shear stress within a crack or pipe, so we have enough reservoir to push that uh, water through a pipe, and there's some velocity of how fast that water's uh, flowing through that pipe. It's imparting that shear stress on the sides of the wall. We can compare that to what we think the critical shear stress of that soil is based on some some lab testing that we do. You know, uh, some materials are more erosive than others, and we should wrap our arms around that. We should think about that. And we should uh, compare that to how much uh, shear stress we think we're actually applying to that flaw. That'll help us inform us about the likelihood of uh, initiating erosion. Um, for backward erosion. Backward erosion piping, estimated seepage exit gradients exceed critical values. We have a lot of case histories on that. We have a lot of performance data on that. There's been a lot of research on that. Um, for soil contract erosion, Darcy and velocities, you know, this is the one where we're flowing through like a coarse material adjacent to a fine material, do those Darcy and velocities uh, exceed those critical shear stress values for that soil that will eventually erode. For internal migration, um, only a downward, downward vertical gradient is needed, or maybe not even that, just gravity. So is it there? There's no generalized methods for accurately predicting the critical gradient for suffusion. Excuse me, but again, you know, we're, that's not something you're gonna have to worry too much about in your, in your risk assessment lives. Key factors about initiation depends on the unfavorable coincidence of a critical hydraulic condition, um, a critical stress condition, and material susceptibility, as illustrated by this lovely Venn diagram here. Uh, some key factors affecting initiation of an internal erosion process are listed here for soil gradations, uh, gradation, particle size, density, plasticity, erodibility are key parameters. Um, Hydraulic gradients and seepage velocities for particle movement are generally considered uh, as a key and key, as key factors for initiation. Hydraulic gradients easy to measure in the laboratory, but velocity kind of less so. In the field, both are difficult or impossible to measure. So the overall uh, average gradients along the entire sus uh, suspected internal erosion pathway are usually estimated when evaluating internal erosion. That's how we speak about this. So we can't figure out those individual things. We just talk about gradients a lot. We kind of calibrate our our, our internal erosion brains uh, on that on that nomenclature. Um, okay, let's talk about our second phase: continuation. Uh, filter is there a filter? Can we stop this thing from keeping going? That's 
But once erosion is initiated, it will continue unless eroding forces are reduced or the passage of the eroded particles is impeded in some way, like with a filter. Thus, erosion may be interrupted or arrested by filtering action in downstream materials in the embankment or the foundation. Filters are designed to prevent particle movement from intragranular seepage flow, where defects are present in a base soil or seepage water flows through pore spaces of a soil mass in the embankment or foundation. Um, a lot of dams have filter or transition zones uh, that are coarser than required by modern, modern filter design criteria. I think that's because a lot of our dams were built 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 60, 70 years ago, and we've kind of been uh, continuing to update those criteria. So a lot of them don't meet filter design standards, but we can look at them um, and try to estimate their performance based on some work that, some, that Foster and Phil did um, in 2001. Um, we're going to talk more about that. So for internal migration, uh, effective grain size, uh, uh, opening of defects in the conduits, pipes, culverts, or the soil or rock mass can be used to assess whether internal erosion will continue. Um, typical unfiltered exit locations include but aren't limited to the figures on this slide. Um, figure on the upper left shows internal erosion through the foundation into a drainage blanket that does not meet filter criteria exiting at a free face or into uh, coarser layers in the foundation that don't meet filter criteria. Filter on the upper right shows internal erosion through a homogeneous embankment and exiting on a free face. There's nothing there to stop it. Um, the bottom figure show, uh, shows internal erosion into open joints or defects or cracks in conduits, walls, or rocks that allow surrounding soil particles to pass through them. So that was happening in 2000 and a couple other uh, pretty big dam failures or incidents. Um, so gradation and the ability to adequately retain particles is the most important factor for our filter performance. Um, but even if a filter or downstream zone exists, there could be factors outside of gradation that affect the likelihood of continuation. Other filter considerations include cracking based on the fines content of the actual filter itself. Um, can we crack that filter and actually, uh, you know, damage it? Is there, is there fines in our, in our filter or has it cemented? Uh, washed out due to segregation or internal instability resulting in a coarser filter than what we actually intended. Um, inadequate filter width, maybe just we, we designed it too thin and so during construction it just kind of pinched out on some locations. Um, durability resulting in degradation due to weathering, breakdown of weaker particle shapes, or even when we're sort of constructing and, and compacting it, we actually damage it and make it finer than we mean to. Um, Heave due to insufficient cover if the filter is only uh, is the only material in the downstream embankment phase. Do we just wash it off? Uh, is there sufficient permeability of the filter and downstream zones prefer, uh, to perform to the required drainage function? Um, so let's talk about phase three here. Progression. Um, it's the process of developing and enlarging an erosion pathway through the embankment or foundation. Once initiated and not arrested by filter action, internal erosion will progress under mechanical and hydraulic condition. For the mechanical condition, again, crack must be sustained by hydraulic pressure. Um, so it's not gonna, it's not gonna swell closed or that roof's not gonna collapse. Um, a stable roof is inherently not applicable to internal migration and stoping because we need that, those materials to just kind of fall down into these open voids. Um, but the pathway much shouldn't clog. Um, for the hydraulic condition, sufficient gradient or velocity must exist to provide sufficient energy or drag force to continue to transport particles along the openings. Um, so is that is that pool going to stay up there long enough and at a high at a high level enough or a high enough elevation to continue to erode these materials? So. Um, if there's no continuous embedded structure like a conduit or something like that that's going to give us our roof, um, the ability to sustain a roof depends mainly on the, on the properties of, of the of the eroding soil. Um, soils with fine contents greater than or equal to 15 percent, even less if it's a plastic material or a plastic uh, fines content, are likely to hold a roof regardless of the plasticity of the fines. Um, Teams may need to consider the likelihood of a crack not swelling shut for higher plasticity soils or stable sidewalls being maintained along the crack in lieu of holding a roof. 
So we're jumping around a little bit between backwards erosion piping and concentrated leak erosion here. Um, so this left photo is formed by the hard pan at uh, A.B. Watkins Dam. And the Utah, so there was actually a continuous failure path all the way underneath this, this hard pan layer up through there. They moved a whole bunch of sand out that you like little three now. Interesting case history. So this is actually a pipe eroded by water flowing through a crack for an inch of paper. And it started to erode and secure a lot because the cracks weren't treated. You know, old sandies with simple concrete or something like that. And this was actually, I think it was like Swift number three or something like that. Swift number two, power connect. Washington State. Um, there's a, the lake above this. This is, this is stone, it's rock. The lake above it, back here, the uh, bottom of the lake kind of wore through and connected to the usually soil that was in this area and basically blew out the toe. And so there was actually a rock roof. I think that's exactly that's, that's what, how that thing progressed. Anyways, the roof can look like different things. Uh, in different situations. Crack filling action. Is there anything upstream that can uh, prevent this thing from continuing? So progression may stop if particles from a zone upstream of the core are transported into the crack or developing pipe and eventually seal the filter. For crack stopping to occur, there must be a filter or transition downstream of the core to trap the eroded particles, provided the leakage flow is not too great. Um, it's dependent on the comp compatibility of the particle sizes of the granular soils upstream of the core. So is it big enough to actually move into and seal that? Uh, the hydraulic condition. So as that pipe or crack enlarges, <coughs> hydraulic shear stresses increase and erosion will progress until the hydraulic condition uh, changes to reduce the hydraulic stress causing the erosion. So if that pipe gets larger and larger, uh, more and more flow is going through it, going to go through it faster and faster. So at the same height, reservoir height, you're actually imposing more uh, stress on it. So it's a self-feeding process. Um, in small reservoirs, the water level can drop below the level of the pipe to reduce the hydraulic gradient and hydraulic shear stress. In fact, that's one of your number of ways to actually intervene, is to basically open everything up and drain the water out of that reservoir to try and arrest uh, the failure. Another scenario is flow, is flow limitation, when flow in the concentrated leak is limited by head losses in the upstream or downstream zones, causing that pipe to reach an equal, equilibrium condition where it just doesn't progress anymore. Um, so something else to consider is intervention. And we, we call it unsuccessful intervention because of the way we kind of put things together in the ventries. <laughs> Considers the likelihood that human efforts to detect and stop or slow the internal erosion process from breaching the embankment to Fail to work. Intervention can occur anytime uh, or at any location in the sequence of events, any time in the event tree. Typically, it's considered after progression since unsuccessful detection or intervention leads to breach, but think about overtopping. We know an overtopping event is typically going to happen a couple of days beforehand. We can maybe uh, raise the crust before the thing strikes. We're certainly not going to do it when overtopping is happening. So it can happen at any time. We are good at this. As an organization, we're pretty good at it. We got a pretty good track record of. Has it, how many of you guys have been on a flood fight before? Yeah, it's a great experience. You're out there, you're fighting it, you're doing things. You're actually preventing these internal erosion things happening by ringing uh, sand boils. Um, you know, maybe you're actually stacking up um, sandbags on the crest. We can do things. We can mobilize people to actually uh, decrease the likelihood of failure. So we want to account for that in our risk assessment. And then breach, um, fourth and final phase of the internal erosion. So catastrophic like failure, it can look like a, a lot of different things. Um, so we have a video of this, um, this sequence of photos right here. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. Um, again, uncontrolled release of impounded water, liquid-borne solids, and gross enlargement of the pipe uh, or concentrated leak starts to get really big, and then crest collapses. And then we overtop and um, bad things happen. Sloughing or uh, breaching can look like a lot of different things. Sometimes it's really hard to tell what it's going to look like. So it could even be, you know, the sloughing or unraveling of the downstream phase until eventually we just lose that crest. Um, so this is the Ike Dike. 
um, test done by Rex Waterstock in the Netherlands. Um, essentially, this is a big embankment, and we're zoomed in on the toe right now. So there's water being impounded behind this. They introduce a walk through here, and they have water going through here, and it gets bigger. And things continue. And I'm not 100% sure how long this video goes on. Um, but anyway, this is a depiction of what that uh, route should look like. So uh, we have this continuous path through here on the first photo. Um, we're, we're flowing water through here. That water gets a little bit bigger. We start to head cut down here. We start to lose this material at this vertical face that marches upward until eventually it lowers the crest or takes the crest out and they wash the whole thing and cut out. So a breaching mechanism for overclumping can look a little bit like, like this uh, mechanism as well, except there's no failure path through the embankment just going over the thing. Anyways, in our video here, things just pretty continue to progress. Uh, there's another view of it. You can see we're starting to collapse the crest. I'm pretty sure that when they built this thing, it was flat all the way across. So we're actually removing material. We see this muddy water boiling out gravel here. We're actually taking material from within the embankment, and it's so it's just dropping, it's sagging down. And if this reservoir was tall enough back here, it would already be over top. And it would just increase the failure, uh, or the, the, the rate of the failure, excuse me. Uh, there it is progressing more. We start the overtopping. Things go bad, from bad to worse. Now it's, it's advancing upstream. We're kind of at this point, or really we're at this point, and something like that, where this head cut is starting to march upstream. And then we have failure. <laughs> Concentrated leak road. So these are a couple of slides about a couple of the big uh, failure modes that we deal with: concentrated leak erosion and backwards erosion piping. Just a little bit more specifics on those. Um, again, concentrated leak erosion is one of the most common internal erosion processes. This slide shows some common locations where it can occur. So, case four: it's along a conduit associated with a flaw or a low stress zone in the embankment fill along the conduit. Um, so think about in some situations where we have a round pipe going through and um, it's really difficult to compact around those haunches of that pipe. And so we're, we've got a hard time of compacting the soils. So if it goes, if it's like that all the way from upstream to downstream, we can get water that just starts to kind of find its way through there. And when we pile enough water up behind it, the, the rate of that water flowing through there increases until it overcomes that sheer stress of the material, starts to erode it, bad things happen. Case five is through a construction flaw, which could be associated with a lot of things described in the chapter. Um, a couple of key ones are seasonal shutdowns, stage construction surfaces. So we, we leave these things, we build them later, um, leave there for the winter. It's desiccated, some things, weird things happen to it, um, and we don't regrade it before we start fill, uh, adding more fill on, so we've built in a flaw. Um, 5B is near horizontal crack, which can be associated with a low stress zone due to arching at the abutments or in the embankments. Um, can occur at the abutment contact, can also occur due to differential settlement of the foundation. So essentially, this crack isn't just on the downstream face, it's a plane all the way through the embankments that essentially, because we have maybe a soft spot here and a hard spot here, this part of the embankment can settle downward while this stays shut. And so this we have this tension crack open up. You know, it's continuously from up to the downstream. Um, case 1A is a soil contact erosion or another form of scour, which results from flow and open work gravel in the foundation eroding adjacent soils above or below it. The internal erosion process often leads to concentrated leak erosion. So this would be what an event tree looks like uh, for that. Again, typically would be used to specifically in quantitative risk assessment, but it's useful in all levels of risk assessment. Helps us understand the process, not just how we um, communicate it to decision makers, but also amongst ourselves. We all want to agree on what we're assessing erosion of. Um, so, flood loading, uh, flood, transverse cracks, and this kind of crack. Maybe we have this. This talks about how those cracks might happen, uh, continuation, 
Is there a filter here that's going to stop us uh, from that soil from eroding? Progression, crack stability, roof. Flow limitation, are we going to keep that uh, reservoir up long enough and with sufficient height to keep the pressure on? Uh, anything upstream is going to heal that crack? Can we do anything about it? And finally, do we breach? Um, solar deal, um, this is at a soil rock interface, it's right here. So we have a crack, a water fill into a crack, and we start to uh, scour that material to build a it. This is what it would look like in the constructed phase of during construction to actually prevent that. So we're actually making a concrete face, which is really good to uh, compact fill up against. But if we had to compact fill up against stuff that just looks like all this that we don't treat, then there's a lot more likely that we're building in a flaw. We will not avoid that if we can do anything about it. Yeah, so this is a little bit of different uh, things in the gradient. You know, our, our pipe it changes, so we're trying to look at where the critical pipe is. In the interest of time, let's keep moving. Yep, let's keep moving. So let's talk about a couple of case histories for concentrated lake erosion through the embankments. Uh, Worcester Dam, Oklahoma. 1949. So this is a serious incident during initial filling. Um, right afterwards, so a bunch of muddy leakage emerged from the downstream face right here. This is kind of hard to see. In fact, I think maybe in a couple of there's a series of these photos, and in one of these you can kind of see a car top of the bank. Anyways, I think this guy is essentially taking a picture from the tow. You see all this water flowing out about mid slope. Things have gone bad. Here's a, a depiction of what that looked like. I think this was here at the time of the failure. Uh, Anyhow, um, transverse cracking due to differential settlement, successful intervention. This what saved this thing. That was in the form of being able to lower the pool fast enough to bring it down below the entrance. So essentially, what happened here is maybe out of the paper, uh, the foundation was sitting on the uh, a harder of No, into the paper, it was sitting on well compacted fill. Out of the paper, it was sitting on uh, residual soils left in place that were more compressible than that compacted fill. So as the dam settled from the soft spot and into a hard spot, and so a crack opened right there, water was able to go through, things went bad. Um, also West Tulsa levee. Um, it's a levee system and a use case case history where partial breaches occurred at multiple locations in 1986 when the levee was loaded to 80% of its height. So likely poor compaction around those conduits that pass through the levee in the vicinity of a pump station, which were mainly corrugated steel or metal pipes. Those things uh, suck as levee penetrations. If you see them, that's generally not a good thing. Back erosion piping of erodible soils beneath the um, beneath the conduit. I'm not sure back erosion piping is appropriate right there. Anyways, oh, may have contributed to the problem as well. Um, you may need to consider both possibilities when assessing the risk in, of a particular structure. Um, so I think there was no presence of a filter there. This is that height that went through here. Again, like, this is kind of a weird thing to, to, to compact around. So really a good way to think about it is we can have this material with the big yellow equipment, huge stuff, big stuff, consistently, repeatedly, over and over again. Very unlikely to have a, a flaw in it. Here, you got guys in here with uh, you know, jumping jack things or you know, sticks that just bounce up and down to like try and get dirt in there as best they can, if not nearly as uh, successful or consistent. And it oftentimes ends up being a location for poor performance. Backward version piping. Um, so this slide shows typical locations where it can occur. There must be a continuous layer of fine to medium uniform sand and an unfiltered seepage. Case one is through the foundation. Case two is from the embankment core into an open work gravel foundation. Case three through the embankment core into a downstream shell. Um, and case four is along a conduit. Here's our typical event tree. We have sort of this confining layer. The previous layer, which is going to be where the trouble happens, 
uh, we're able to get water into it and it ruptures the the, uh, the downstream area, uh, the downstream toe for sort of like a confining layer that's like a uh, a cohesive layer. Uh, but the sort of that key that then kind of exposes this underlying material that heaves and starts to essentially erode that material out, or there's just defects in it, like rodent holes or something like that. Um, that allows that to continue. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like as it's happening. So we start to erode the material at this pipe head right here, and there's sufficient flow in this pipe to take those eroded materials and actually continue to move them downstream. So this pipe can continue to work itself upstream until it taps into this reservoir. And you have that continuous open pipe from here to here, very bad. That's when things really accelerate and you've likely lost your embankment. We touched on A.B. Watkins um, a little bit ago. It's a, again, it's a reclamation dam in Utah where back erosion piping occurred in the foundation sands beneath a caliche or so like a hard pan layer. Uh, under, under a roof formed by that material to a horizontal unfiltered exit in a drainage ditch at the downstream end. A uh, serious incident occurred in 2006 at very low hydraulic uh, gradients, like really low, and the abatement would have likely failed without successful intervention efforts at both the downstream toe and at the upstream face. So I think they put down some sort of a, um, some sort of quickly, uh, quickly placed filter burn down at the downstream end, then I think they were able to isolate where um, the water was coming in at the upstream end, and then they put a bunch of material on top of this too. So they kind of just put a whole bunch of fill, I think, at the, end, the upstream and downstream ends. Inslee Levy. <coughs> this is an interesting one. So what you're seeing here, <laughs> excuse me, these things, I don't know if you Maybe a little better. See these, these indentations right here? These showed up like six months after the flood. <laughs> so these are pathways underneath. So this is our confining layer here, this drawn, the grass is drawn in, some kind of cohesive layer. And there was pathways in a sand underneath that that those roofs collapsed onto. And so that's evidence that these are partially formed pathways. I don't know if these went all the way underneath the container, but it was kind of bad. Back erosion piping. Uh, Chucky Canal. Let's see. So this is um, back erosion piping into and along conduits. That's what this would look like. They use water the conduit to go take a look. Lo and behold, they have these cracks that are shooting water into them. So during typical service, these this water flowing into these uh, into this, uh, this conduit that goes all the way through our embankment, probably carrying um, embankment materials along with it. So now we have voids on the outside of this thing, and if those voids start to interconnect from upstream to downstream. That would be very bad if we have a continuous open pathway. Or we can continue to move uh, material into here and we start to stoke that material above it until we get a sinkhole that opens up because we move some material out into our conduit, which we would never know because water flowing through, through here is just carrying all that material around. So, and, and this is what that looks like. So, Here's our crack in this pipe. Um, it starts to uh, form a sinkhole up here. If we have something more like an interconnected um, pathway of flaws, like an karstic bedrock or something like that, it basically can start to take this hole is very large. This is this is it far into it has it's it's advanced considerably. So it started out by the just kind of slowly getting carried away. It grows, grows, grows until we open up. Beneath the reservoir, now we've got essentially full reservoir ahead. This location of the dam, where this is where you know, um, breach is kind of tough to, to kind of anticipate. How is this going to breach? Probably going to be through some sloughing of the downstream shell. You know, we're trying we're to blow this toe out. It's going to start to just slough and start to almost wash away because we have all this full embankment head right here. Uh, here's an internal. Uh... An event tree for internal migration. Um, this is a big, this was a big uh, deal in the core, uh, core portfolio. So this is Fontenelle Dam in 1965. This happened, the, I think, 12 years before Teton. 
but this really woke us up to a lot of different things and how the our construction process is working. So the zone nerve build data, a low plasticity core founded on joints and bedrock that wasn't sufficiently treated. Um, two lines of defense, special compaction and grouting, but no foundation treatment upstream and downstream of that, and there's no filters. So Dan may well have failed, if not the ability to lower that pool quickly. So again, that was our number one um, intervention technique was to actually be able to drain that pool. So you can see things got pretty serious before we were able to arrest that place. Well, freak down, uh, Kentucky. Highly karstic degree, as you can see. Um, Poor foundation treatment, even though, I mean, they, this was before construction. I mean, they excavated a lot of this material out of here, but we just didn't do it. We weren't quite thorough enough. Um, so ideally, we would be able to get in here and excavate the less material and back to this with concrete. And, you know, at the same time, injecting gravity in these rocks associated with it, essentially trying to neutralize any future development of uh, distress. Um, in this in this material that is, you know, that is uh, soluble and would be susceptible to forming new voids in it, especially when you put 152 feet ahead across it. That's really going to accelerate things. Because Mother Nature did this on our own by just over the course of thousands of years, but just water flowing downhill. When you put 150 head, feet ahead across something that's not very wide, you're going to accelerate things considerably. And so, when it looked like is when we finally uh, were able to address this issue. We mowed through a whole line of this rock, just putting a, a car off. That was a seems to solve the problem. Something lasts for quite a long time. Uh, Quail Creek Dyke, it's an interesting one. Um, case history of internal migration into the rock foundation. It failed after about four to five years of operation. Kind of a weird thing. So calling the structure a dike may not have been appropriate. It was actually a dam. There's, so there was connected to another dam that they were really thorough with about foundation treatment because but because this was a dike, it was like, eh, it's not that big of a deal. So their their uh, their foundation preparations were not very well, uh, were, were not very thorough, um, lack of understanding regarding the geologic factors, related to some soluble salts and vertical joint system with pre-dam solution features in the foundation. Um, yeah, just kind of led to poor operation and eventually failure. Internal migration into drains is something to be considered. So, you know, many jams are constructed with proper filter surroundings, but not all of them. Um, in addition, in the case of corrugated metal pipes and many levees, these drains can corrode and deteriorate over time. Um, a lot of times this results in sinkholes, um, not really a whole lot of incidents or failures, um, but yeah, something to be avoided. We can, try, we can, we can do better engineering here. So this is an erodible material. So think like a silky sand type stuff. They've got an embankment behind it. This guy's pulling up the bottom. Evaluation process. Um, fully just, so this is essentially the evaluation process of doing a risk assessment on an internal erosion. I describe the finished failure mode, assemble all your available background performance data. It's free. Let's use it. Take advantage of it. Um, select loading partitions for floods and or earthquakes if you're doing quantitative risk assessments. Agree on the critical driving uh, load for uh, SQRA quantitative. 
doing useful screening of nodes in the inventory, performing supporting evaluations, filter compatibility analysis, um, things like that. Consider all supporting analysis, historical rates, case histories. Get to understand the failure mode and your dam. Estimate the probability for, for uh, a, a, a likelihood of a failure mode occurring. Make the case. Convince people that you're right. Bring the most forward the most important salient points of your risk assessment. Don't don't rely, don't expect people to make those up. Um, potential supporting evaluations include um, evaluate instrumentation, monitoring trends, take pertinent case histories, hydraulic shear stress, pernicious of concentrated leak erosion. This is a spreadsheet that we have on the RMC website, pretty helpful. Seeking analysis, um, a little bit more complicated. Sometimes they're already available. I'm utilizing critical gradient for initiation, progression, vector, and typing, spreadsheet analysis, uh, uh, filter uh, compatibility analysis, spreadsheet analysis. Uh, inform your judgment. You guys are doing it right now. You're learning. Continue to learn. Get better. Think about these things. Participate in these risk assessments. Um, nurse that through your whole career. Also do other things, uh, statistical methods, to, you, historical rates to help uh, inform your judgment. Um, analytical, analytical methods to inform your judgment. These toolbox, these spreadsheet toolboxes that we're talking about. And then uh, likelihood factors for each event. Um, you know, understanding what, what the, there's more things that go into it. Uh, there's different ways to present that data. Uh, we typically use that in more or less likely factors. And you guys have probably talked about that a little bit already. Um, these tables represent a compilation of findings and a judgment for many researches as well as findings for empirical cases. Hopefully they sum up the, ca the case for the, uh, the cases for the uh, potential failure mode. So utilize those things, estimating probabilities. Final probabilities are estimated using team elicitation procedures used upon the totality and strength of the evidence. There will be indications that allow degrees of belief, estimates of the probability of failure, explore every clue available to guide judgment, the least likely or likely side of the event considered. 